Brethren, all we who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized into his death. Words taken from the lesson today and we heard in the gospel. Taking the seven loaves, giving thanks, he broke and gave to his disciples to set before the people. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up that which was left of the fragments, seven baskets. Words taken from the gospel for this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. During the early centuries of the church in northern Africa, we hear this account. Forty-nine Christians had assembled in a private house to assist at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which was said by the priest Saturninus. The officers of justice broke into the house during the celebration of the sacred mysteries, arrested those who were present, and conveyed them before the public tribunal under a guard of soldiers. By order of the judge, they were sent in chains to Carthage, the capital city of the province, where they were again examined and cruelly tortured. Being asked by the proconsul why they had assembled together in spite of the decrees of the emperor, Saturninus answered in the name of the rest. It is because we are not allowed to be absent from the sacred mysteries. This is the commandment and the teaching of the divine law. This law we faithfully observe, and for it we are ready to lay down our lives. Another one said among their number, We cannot live without the Lord's Supper. And one of the women, martyrs, confessed her faith, saying, Yes, I went to the assembly, and I celebrated the Lord's Supper with my brothers and sisters, because I am a Christian. Upon this, the judge ordered them to be cast into prison, where those who had survived the tortures inflicted upon them shortly fell victims to starvation and the hardships of their confinement. Stories of how many before us were willing to fulfill their Sunday obligation to the point of even shedding their blood. Listen to the Roman martyrology for Christmas. At Nicomedia, that's in the Middle East, the passion of many thousands of holy martyrs assembled for divine service on Christ's birthday. The emperor Diocletian ordered the doors of the churches to be shut and fire to be prepared all around them and a tripod of incense to be set before the doors and that a herald should cry out in a loud voice that they who desire to escape the fire should come forth outside and offer incense to Jove. All with one voice declared that they would gladly die for Christ's sake and were consumed by the fire which had been kindled and so merited to be born in heaven on that very day wherein Christ, for the world's salvation, deigned to be born on earth. Again, people willing to die and sacrifice everything to fulfill the obligation given to us by the divine law. But the Ten Commandments, thou shalt keep the Lord's day holy. The church, most especially at the Council of Trent, has commanded her priests to speak on the mystery of this holy mass. Why? So that both the priest himself and the faithful would be able to enter more deeply into the mysterium fidei, the mystery of the faith. That's in the words of the consecration over the chalice. This is the mystical and mysterious door that opens up to us, heaven and Calvary, the mystery of the faith. From the time of the second consecration all the way to the time when the priest consumes the chalice, these doors are open. In this way, the priest, acting as a good shepherd, strives to prevent God's faithful people from being numbered among those who say, Lord, Lord, without truly entering into the kingdom of God. But instead, these people will fulfill more completely the will of the Lord who said, do this in memory of me. 
So let us once again contemplate something of the profound mysteries that are present here in this holy and mysterious and beautiful Mass. Let us begin by reviewing a little of what we learned last week. Namely, that we are baptized in order to enter into this mystery. This is why you are baptized. To come here on this day and enter into the mystery. Thus we heard St. Paul teach, Brethren, all we who are baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized into His death. Now how, we ask, is it possible to be baptized into the death of Christ? Where can we do this? Even literally. Other than this Mass. Having the power of sacramental character imparted to us at our baptism, we can now come to the altar and participate in the sacrifice of Jesus the King. When He dies on the cross, we can be there. That's what baptism enables us to do. It is the sacramental character that enables us to take advantage of those doors. That's why we must be baptized. Now we can die with Him, at least mystically in our intentions. Remember St. Thomas the Apostle? Let us go and die with Him. We should say that at every Mass. We're on the way to church, way to Mass. I want to go and I want to die with Christ at the consecration so that I can rise with Him. There it is. This is what the double consecration offers us. An opportunity to die with Christ so that we can rise with Him. Then, after the Pater Noster, so we got the double consecration, that's the representation of Calvary. You're there, Christ is dying. Then we got the Pater Noster. After the Pater Noster, the Our Father comes to Fraxio, where the host is broken, over the chalice. And then it breaks a little piece of the host and puts it in the chalice, a particle. So Christ died at the consecration, separation of body and blood, double consecration. So with His body and blood being separated, He's dead. Now, with the host being broken and reunited with the blood, He's back alive. He's resurrected. This is shown in the Mass at the Fraxio that He is truly risen. Thus, we heard St. Paul say today, For we are buried together with Him and by baptism unto death, that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. In other words, once again, he who dies with Christ at the consecration rises with Him at the fraxio. This is why we're baptized. So, at the consecration, then offer yourself, your whole self. Be willing to die with Him, to be separated from all things, to gain Christ. No matter what they are, nothing is more important than Him. When we do this, something amazing begins to happen. When we're really ready to die, we're ready to live. When you're ready to die... Then you're ready to live. It's a proven fact. This is how the saints conquered the world and accomplished so many memorable deeds. Think of our Lord in His agony. He's struggling with His passion and His death. But once He said, Your will be done, not mine, He went through that passion like a giant. Never flinched. It was all over in the agony. He was ready to die. No matter what they did to Him, they could not get him to fail. When you're ready to die, you're ready to live. Let's take an example from the, the Bible, another example. St. Elias, otherwise known as Elijah, the prophet of old. If you know his story, he was fed up with the world. He fell down beneath a tree in the desert. Here, read the cross. In other words, he went to Mass. Fed up with the world, had enough. He went to the cross, a tree, and he asked for death. Maybe at the consecration we do the same. The cross is there, represented for us. We can say, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. That's what Elias did. I'm no better than my father's. 
He attended the mass and something happened. An angel came twice, struck him and said, get up and eat. He gave him, as it were, holy communion. And with this refreshment, Elias rose up to continue to do bold and brave things. And he has yet to die. Elias is not dead. He's still alive. He never died. He went up in a chariot. And he's waiting to come back at the end of the world as one of the two witnesses. We can read about that in the Apocalypse chapter 11. Once again, though, he who is ready to die with Christ is ready to live even to the end of the world. Proof, St. Elias. Now, this brings up two practical points. We can pause here for a moment and take advantage of this. Two practical points about attending Holy Mass. Number one, every parish, according to canon law, is to have a Sunday Mass offered pro popolo. That means for the people. Why is this? It is to make sure that all those who are registered in that parish will regularly have the graces of the Holy Mass made available to them. Thus, if you're not registered here, I might encourage you to do so in order to receive the maximum benefits from this Mass, because today's Mass, right now, is being offered pro popolo. If you're registered, you get all the graces that are being offered through this Mass. It's more than just attending. You get a benefit from registering and being a part of this mystical body, this little mystical body, this parish. Please register, fear not. Second of all, when we attend the Mass, we are practicing for heaven. We are striving to die to self. And as St. Paul said, our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin may be destroyed and that we may serve sin no longer. When you're ready to die with Christ, you're ready to live virtuously, even to the end of the world. Now, one way we can die to ourselves, even as we attend Mass in these warm months of summer, is to dress modestly. Think about it. Why are we here? In a word, we're here to worship God. We're to love Him, we're to adore Him, and even as we've said, to die with Him as He taught us. Each Sunday, we genuflect at the point of the creed where we profess the Son of God became flesh by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary. The priest genuflects in adoration and immediately after the consecrating of the host. We genuflect again in the last gospel at the end of Mass at the words, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Clearly, we come to Sunday Mass to adore, to bend our knee before the hallowed flesh of the Savior. On the other hand, very important, people do not come here, and shame on them if they do. We do not come to Mass to see other people's flesh. Those who attending Holy Mass, therefore, are asked in all kindness to cover their flesh adequately so as not to offend God and distract others from their fruitful adoration and reception of the body of Christ. Thus, St. Paul says, among other things, the works of the flesh are immodesty. That's a work of the flesh, fallen flesh. But among the fruits of the Spirit, he says, is modesty, continency, chastity. In another place, he says this, I will therefore that men pray in every place, lifting up pure hands, pure hands. In other words, you see the Mass, cross, without anger and contention. In like manner, women also in decent apparel, adorning themselves with modesty and sobriety, not with plated hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but as it becometh women professing godliness with good works. Thank you, St. Paul. One can certainly dress comfortably without violating modesty. Listen to Pope Pius XII. There's nothing wrong in being fashionable. God does not require us to ignore the dictates of fashion so that we look grotesque. But fashion can never be the supreme rule of conduct. Then he says quite well, there is a limit beyond which fashion can bring about the ruin of a soul. I dare say 
Fashion is bringing about the ruin of many souls today. There is a limit, he said, beyond which fashion can bring about the ruin of a soul. And we might add to Pope Pius that there's also a limit by which others will be distracted. And not only that, ourselves from proper worship. Remember that you will be present before all heaven and before our Lord on Calvary at the consecration and beyond. Let's dress rightly for that. And we should be sure not to dress seductively, even if we're covering our flesh. I think sometimes that's forgotten. I don't want to be a distraction to my fellow human being. Now, returning to St. Paul's exhortation that we die with Christ, let us recall what we learned last week. Namely, that if we start with the first tablet, the commandments that belong to God, fulfilling our obligations toward God, this leads to our overcoming difficulties in the second tablet, our tablet belonging to our fellow man. Such things as anger, ill will, hatred, lying, stealing, lust, broken relationships. As the gospel stated last Sunday, if we come to the altar properly, then we'll be able to go out readily and be reconciled with our neighbor. Thus, last Sunday, we settled on this basic formulation. If we do not shed the blood of Christ in the mystical way that he has made possible through the mass, that's the first tablet. If we do not do the first tablet properly, we will shed the blood of our fellow man. We will break the second tablet. Think of Moses. He went to Pharaoh and he said, give us some time to go out in the desert and worship God properly. And what did Pharaoh say? No. Nope, I'm not going to let you fulfill the commandments of God, the first tablet. Then what happened? Well, much evil was visited upon the Egyptians and upon Pharaoh. The book of Wisdom, chapter 11, says that those who sought to fulfill God's commands with Moses were given drink of a fountain of ever-running water. And those who did not, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, were given human blood. The river turned not just to blood, human blood. You threw all those babies in the water, now you're going to drink it. All your firstborn are going to die. Your cattle are going to die. You're going to be wallowing in blood. Not only that, when you cross the Red Sea and chasing after these people, you're going to drown. Wow, that's amazing. Once again, if we do not shed the blood of Christ in a mystical way that he has made possible through Mass, we will shed each other's blood. Now we can add to this, if we die with him at the Mass, this is our next principle we're talking about today. If we die with him at Mass, we'll be ready to live with him forever. No matter what happens, we'll be able to fulfill the whole law. If people leave off dying with Christ at the Mass, they will end in despair, we can say, or a fear-driven life, a fear-driven existence. They will do things out of fear. Now, in keeping with this principle, this theme, consider this profound story from Maria von Tropp. She wrote this. Our neighbors in Austria were a young couple, Baron and Baroness K. They were getting increasingly curious about communist Russia and what life there was really like. One day they decided to take a six-week trip all over Russia in their car. And this was in the time when it was still possible to get a visa. Of course, on the border, they were received by a special guide who watched their every step and did not leave them for a moment until he deposited them safely again at the border. But they still managed to get a good first-hand impression. Upon their return, they wrote a book about their experiences and when it was finished, they invited their neighbors and friends to their home in order to read some of their work to them. I shall always recall how slowly and solemnly Baron K read us the title, The Land Without a Sunday. Of all the things they had seen and observed, one experience had most deeply impressed them, that Russia had done away with Sunday. This had shocked them even more than 
what they had saw of Siberian concentration camps or of the misery and hardship of cities and country. The absence of Sunday seemed to be the root of all the evil. Baron K. told us, instead of a Sunday, the Russians have a day off. This happens at certain intervals, which vary in different parts of the country. First, they had a five-day week with a six-day off. Then they had a nine-day work period with a tenth day off. Then again, it was an eight-day work week. What a difference, she wrote. What a difference between a day off and a Sunday. The people work in shifts. While one group enjoys its day off, the others continue to work in the factories or on the farms or in the stores, which are always open. As a result, the overall impression throughout the country was one of incessant work, work, work. The atmosphere was one of constant rush and drive. Finally, we confessed to each other that what we were missing most was not a well-cooked meal or a hot bath, but a quiet, peaceful Sunday with church bells ringing and people resting after prayer. Thank you, Maria von Tropp. Now, with no Sundays, it's no secret that Russia became a large death camp. A place of fear, gulags, and mass graves. Millions upon tens of millions have died there out of due order, out of due time, during the communist decades. But wait a minute. Haven't we been told over and over again, I know I have, that Russia has been converting. The wall came down, Father. It's okay. They're converting. Listen to a few statistics. Russia has the highest abortion rate in the world, even higher than China's. On average, this is almost mind-boggling, the average Russian woman will have something like eight abortions during her childbearing years. I don't know how that's possible. Russia has both the highest alcoholism and drug use in the world. These are just a few clear signs, and believe me, there are many more. Russia has not converted and is not converting. But what about us? Is not our country, our own country, nay, even our entire continent, nay, we even say the whole world, is becoming a land without a Sunday. We have lost our Sundays. They are no longer days of worship and rest, but shopping and working for many people. What happens to a place and people where they give up the Mass, they give up that first tablet of the commandments. As we have learned, violence is not far away. Despair and suicides will rise, and they are. People are living in fear, arming themselves. You can't even walk down the street today, and there's, you're wondering if there's going to be more senseless killing. There's a lot of senseless killing going on today. But when the Mass is not appreciated... Something must replace it. Not surprisingly, in Russia, according to World Health Organization data, and Andrei Yurovich of the Russian Academy of Sciences, there are some 800,000 sorcerers and wizards acting as healers of the people. Guess their doctors aren't doing a good job. They've got a bunch of shamans. Another clear sign that Russia is not converting. Don't go in for it. From a recent article in First Things, you can look it up. Worship of strange spirits is on the rise in America. We know that. Often in ways we do not acknowledge. Tarot card readers are all over. Ghost hunters, UFO abductees, and shamanic healers. Just go to your local health food store. You'll find all kinds of stuff. It's very common. We're returning to the vomit of the pagans, or worse. According to Pew Research, 65% of Americans believe in the paranormal. And we're not talking about supernatural stuff by God. We're talking about the paranormal, where the devils work. And their number is increasing. Christianity has never denied the reality of what Paul calls principalities and powers. But Christianity's hatred of idols and demons restrained the interest in the occult. 
now that aversion, that Christian aversion to this paranormal, which is very dangerous, is declining along with faithful observance of the Lord's day. Paranormal belief and experience is more common among young people than among the old, among the unchurched than among the religious. In other words, Christianity's decline is leading not to austere secularism, but to a wild flowering of shamanic healers, spirit crystals, and transcendental maraishis. It's leading to possessions. No one better exemplifies, it seems, according to the author of this article, it's very well done, no one better exemplifies the spiritual trajectory of our time than Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, an advocate of scientific rigor who started life as a devout Catholic, and he ended it as one of the world's most prominent spiritualists of the time. While studying with the Jesuits at Stonyhurst, Doyle made his first Holy Communion, and he wrote this to his mom. Oh, Mama, I cannot express the joy that I felt on the happy day to receive my Creator into my breast. I shall never, though I live a hundred years, I shall never forget that day. Arthur Conan Doyle. He was enrolled in the sodality of the Blessed Virgin Mary as Arthur Doyle, perpetual servant of the Blessed Virgin Mary. His promises were sadly forgotten. In adulthood, Doyle championed broad-minded inquiry and rejected the Catholic faith. He said, I regard hard and fast dogma of every kind as an unjustifiable and essentially irreligious thing. He admired Oliver Wendell Holmes, whose skeptical scientific outlook would be immortalized in Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street. Folks, the devil is a murderer from the beginning. and He's the father of lies. Let us seek to limit his powers by attending the Holy Mass, come what may, fulfilling our obligations, even to the shedding of our blood, and serving the Lord in this Holy Mass, fulfilling the first tablet. And he will give us more than we need to survive the difficult week, more than we need to overcome that murderer, that liar. He will give us what is needed to live for him alone, as is indicated in the gospel today. They had much left over after he fed them in the wilderness, he says in the gospel. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up that which was left of the fragments, seven baskets. Let us die with him then at the consecration. And we will be like the saints, ready to live for him here and now and forever in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.